Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are embarking on autobiography of an idea by Louis Sullivan. So today we are going to be talking about why study Louis Sullivan and why study specifically autobiography of an idea. Uh, so we're going to start with, um, it's going to be uh, Sherry, Joya, and Rupali. So we're going to start with uh, Sherry. Sherry, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you all again. Um, I am finding this great fun because it's been probably 20 years since I've read this. I read it uh, at least twice, maybe more um, in my younger days. Um, and so we're going to have that fun experience of Sherry reading her 18 year old self outlining, underlining and, and pondering why on earth I underlined that or, um, or what, what this note means or what this note means. Um, and strangely, I also have this, like, as we were going through kindergarten chats, I don't have this in green highlighter, but apparently at the time I had a green pen. So <laughs> everything is underlined in green. Um, so I had to find a different color to start with this time around. Um, I'm really looking forward to this because this will be the first time that Rob has read this yes, book in sure. total. He's read little Ever. snippets here and there. I don't think I've even read snippets of this one. I think I've read you snippets. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's a few reasons why I think this is a fantastic book to dig into in detail. One is simply because it has the greatest title for an autobiography that I think is ever written. Um, the autobiography of an idea. I think that is just fantastic. It really distills exactly what um, Louis Sullivan was trying to sum his life, life up and under. Um, and I think that's a really fantastic way of going about it. Um, the other thing that I think is really important and the reason we should all be studying this is um, as we were going through kindergarten chats, I started collecting or attempting to collect in my busy life, all of the references to Sullivan's idea of form follows function in everyday architecture news. Um, and it was coming up so often that I couldn't keep track of it. So I'm hoping to actually take a bit of time in the next maybe from now to the end of the summer and whatever news article in architecture press or whatever construction news comes by or notice about somebody's new building material, it's extremely common for them to have some reference to form follows function in one way or another. And I'm gonna try to uh, make a little video or photo montage of all of these because it shows you exactly how important his idea was in the rest of architecture that happened after him. It's quite interesting that most people when they know architects or they know a modern architect, they're not thinking of Louis Sullivan, but that's where all the kernel came from. Um, and it's a completely fascinating story to watch from his idea, the germ of his idea, to how it flowered in so many different ways, um, in, in some ways um, twisted by a philosophy or, or turned by a particular way of approaching an idea. Um, and that's always really fascinating to me too. But I think perhaps the, re the, the, other, the main reason that I love reading this is because we really get to find out who Sullivan was. And um, this is a quote that comes up both in the foreword and in the introduction. So the introduction and the foreword are written by two different architectural historians. And they both mention a, an exact same quote, a reference uh, that Sullivan has. He'll talk about it in the book itself. Um, and which of the two do I want to talk about? I'll take the one in the foreword. And he says here that Sullivan held the conviction that no architectural dictum or tradition or superstition or habit 
should stand in the way of realizing an honest architecture. And I think, remember what we've learned in kindergarten chats, that the architecture is really just a reference or a mirror of who it was that did the designing behind that. So we can rewrite this and say this this way. Sullivan held the conviction that no dictum or tradition or superstition or habit should stand in the way of realizing an honest man or an honest life. And really that's what Sullivan was doing. And it's something that I think we should all really attempt to in our lives. It makes life so much richer. And so the idea that there's no dictum, no tradition, no superstition or habit that should stand in your way, I think is an excellent way reason to read this book. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Sherry. So we've got one more person uh, in the house who is familiar with uh, Sullivan, MK. So what we're going to do is that we're going to go to Joya, then MK, and then Rupali. Uh, Joya. Thank you. Well, I'm going to continue on with what Sherry was saying and expressed. I'm very excited that we're embarking on this book. I think it is a perfect complement to what we've already done with kindergarten chats. In my mind, these books work so well together in tandem. In kindergarten chats, we saw how Louis Sullivan took his ideas and expressed them in the form of how would you educate a young architect in these ideas. And now this book, we get to see how he himself went through that process of education to come up with, with the ideas. And I love Sherry's idea of exploring form follows function with this idea of an autobiography of an idea. It makes me realize that even though this book is the autobiography mm -hmm. of Louis Sullivan and himself, that with that idea, the idea has an autobiography of its own now that, that's extended even beyond Sullivan's life. So I love that if Sherry is going to be able to bring that to our, our conversation. So we, we really see how the idea has continued to grow and thrive even after the, the death of its actual author. For me, this is one of these books that has absolutely changed my life in profound ways starting even with the title, which Sherry was already getting into, that this is the best title of a book ever. And in my life, it is definitely the, the title of a book that has had the most dramatic impact on my own life. Before I even read the book, just seeing the title, the autobiography of an idea, that, that title itself so captured me the first time I read this, which is a little over 10 years ago now. The idea that your autobiography, your life story should add up to an idea. And it got me thinking, well, what is the idea that I want my life story to be about? If I'm writing my own life story through the actions I'm taking in everyday life, what is the big idea that it is all adding up into? Do I even know what that is? And so some of you many of you maybe even on this call know that uh, Joya Fuenica is my chosen name. I legally changed it about 10 years ago now, but it came precisely from reflections that came from this book because I started thinking, do I know what is the idea for my life? And my experience of, of this, of thinking about what is my idea, to me, it was absolutely both a bottom up and now also a top down process in, in, in a beautiful kind of spiral cycling pattern. Because when I asked myself the question, do I know the big idea that I want my life story to add up to? Thinking back just of, at that point in my life, I was just about turning 30, just to turn 30, and just to, to go back and reflect on my life and think about what were the most important lessons that just bubbled up from all the experience that I had and what was the most important for going forward and everything that I wanted to make out of my life. And I realized in an instant that I did have an answer to what is the idea that I want my autobiography to be. 
And it was this idea of joy as the main motivation, the final cause. So, so my name, so Joya means joy. Uh, I was inspired my, I, I have an Italian family background. So figured I should kind of incorporate that. I, when I gave up my old last name, figured I should incorporate some of my Italian heritage. So that's where I got Joya. And interestingly, they, it's spelled slightly different in Italian because they spell it with a, a G-I, which looks really weird to me in English. So I, I changed it to a J, which then made it Portuguese, I found. So just an interesting part of that story. And then Juanica, I was inspired by Aristotelian philosophy. That's his phrase for Aristotle has the four causes and the Huhenica is the final cause. It means that for the sake of which. So that, that's what my name means, it's joy as that for the sake of which. And it's been such an incredible way of organizing now and living my life because even though it kind of bubbled up as the answer that came from the bottom up from my experience, once I was able to clarify that and grasp that conceptually and put that out there and say, this is who I am and who I want to be. And, and, and I'll share, like, I think about it as, as a question that I'm continually asking, like, what is happiness? What is joy? How can I understand this concept most deeply? How can I live it? How can I find it? How can I experience it in my life and bring it to share with everyone? And there's something powerful about having that as your name. For example, even in, in the setting of 52 Living Ideas, when, when Srikanth says, you know, and next up is Joya, it's like, I remember, like, that's me, that's my purpose, that is what I'm here to do, is to find the joy and bring the joy. So it's just been an amazing way that has helped me live such a more flourishing life. And I would have never had that had I never encountered this book and even just the title of this book. But then getting deeper into the, the, the text of the book itself, one of the things that I think is fascinating is even so the title of the book is Autobiography of an Idea. And certainly Form Follows Function is the big idea that Louis Sullivan is known for. But it's interesting to me to even ask like what what is the idea for this autobiography and and i know it, it really struck me in in one of our earlier sullivan meetups the one where i was at the met with ash and maritza and uh, chris that uh, the, the the topic of this book came up and shrikant suggested like oh it's the autobiography an idea and the idea is form follows function which was really interesting to me because i had read this book and that was not the idea Idea that I took from the book, I, I think and still do think the idea is the idea of power. But everyone who is familiar with kindergarten chats and Sullivan's writing knows that Sullivan is one of these writers who has uh, a, a prose style that is uh, very poetic and metaphorical. He doesn't necessarily come out and express things in a very straightforward and direct way. The way I like to think about it, I, I feel his writing mimics nature itself, that he infuses so much of the richness and complexity and depth of nature into his own writing. And then similarly to our own experiences as humans where we have to encounter nature directly and then try to put it in our own words. I feel that's always what Sullivan is doing. He's giving us this really rich prose and we have to go out and experience it and then try to put it into our own words. So I will say going into this reading based on my previous reading, I had thought the idea of the book was the idea of power, but I'm gonna be curious now reading through it again to see if I still think that uh, and to see what, what everyone else comes up with as you go through and read this book and, and encounter it the way that you might encounter nature and try to put it in your own words. So I'm so excited that we're gonna be going on this journey together. Thank you. Wonderful, you've made this into a detective story. Uh, next up is going to be MK. MK, welcome. Uh, what do you think about Louis Sullivan? And what do you think about Autobiography of an Idea? Go ahead. Hello, how are you? Doing all right, go uh, ahead. Thank you. Uh, I've uh, studied, uh, 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 he's uh, uh, generally the uh, postmodern uh, post as and uh, modern architects. 
about uh, six years ago. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm giving uh, new ideas about uh, his, uh, his works, uh, uh, about uh, the Sullivan, uh, Sullivan's works, uh, because uh, we need to, uh, we, we need to uh, get uh, new ideas and new sciences uh, based, on, uh, based on novel sciences like uh, uh, neuroscience. neuroscience. Uh, I think uh, uh, Sullivan and uh, Frank Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Wright, uh, both of them uh, was, uh, were uh, pioneers of uh, using uh, 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 new forms and new shapes in architecture. And uh, uh, Sullivan uh, uh, was one of the pioneers of using fractals and uh, ornaments, uh, ornaments in, uh, in his works. And, uh, and ornament and what and basically what is uh, what is ornaments and what uh, ornaments are uh, the uh, are uh, are the stuffs uh, that uh, use uh, use in the uh, in the faces uh, in the uh, surfaces and the uh, facets of uh, buildings and uh, what is the frac fractals uh, fractals basically they are the uh, they they are the natural uh, objects and na natural uh, grains uh, for example the grains of uh, snow, the form, uh, the basic, uh, the basic uh, form of uh, snow, uh, we call uh, we call that a uh, fractal, and uh, we can use uh, we can uh, see the uh, see them uh, in the in uh, works of uh, uh, Sullivan, and uh, and also uh, we have to uh, we have to mention here that uh, 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 Sullivan and uh, Lloyd Wright, both of them uh, uh, were the pioneers of a romantic and romantic style uh, architecture. Uh, what? Uh, why romantic? Because uh, it's uh, because uh, romantic relates uh, to uh, or organic organic shapes, like uh, using uh, plants uh, uh, and uh, this sort of things, and also using curve uh, curve shapes and uh, cave shapes uh, in in their works. You know, uh, Sullivan and Lloyd, uh, both of them were that. Uh, 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 were the pioneers of uh, postmodernism, because a, pod a postmodernism was a sort of a protest, a protest uh, to the uh, modern and modern works. In uh, and big, uh, why? Because uh, using, uh, because uh, respecting, uh, because respecting the uh, the opinion of people, uh, on uh, opinion of uh, folks. And uh, 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 M.K., have yeah. you read uh, Autobiography of an Idea? That's that's what we are discussing uh, mostly on. So it's a quick comments on Louis Sullivan. Have you read Autobiography of an Idea? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you I, think about the book? Uh, no, no, no. I I don't. But uh, I I am gonna uh, give new ideas about his his works. Oh no, that, that that we will do that later on. I'll give you a chance to talk about that later. Right now, we are just introducing Autobiography yeah. of an Idea, or what yeah. what the book is. Uh, I I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't read uh, that a uh, book uh, okay. that book but uh, but uh, I'm I'm gonna uh, give new uh, new ideas and uh, new uh, overlooks about and uh, new landscapes about uh, the new sciences. Uh, Wonderful. So I'm, we'll do that. We'll do that little I'm bit. Later on. We, we'll uh, do that little I'm, bit later on. We are, first yeah. we are just going to talk about autobiography of an idea. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll give you a chance to talk about that little later. Okay. Uh, okay. Next up is uh, Rupali. Rupali, go ahead. Uh, Rupali, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so, Louis Sullivan, uh, you know, not only as an architect, but also just as a um, thinker, uh, gives, he's very inspirational. And this book, just like Kindergarten Chats, uh, has helped me grow uh, as an educator and personally. Uh, as a human being. So I feel that uh, this, the reason why we should read this book, I feel there are five reason per, reasons personally for me. One is just to look at history. And in the uh, introduction, uh, it says history according to 
a question which I once scrawled in an old textbook is times negative. Looking at it, it is the mirror of the past. Looking through it, it is the lens to the future. And so, so uh, why study Louis Sullivan who lived uh, about 150 years ago and how does that um, help us today? So that's one question, you know, you can learn a lot from the past. The second is the timeless quality of his work. He has just generated so much work. He um, designed and built over 130 buildings within his time period. He wrote a lot, um, he spoke a lot, he had an opinion about uh, the work that existed in his times and what should happen in the future. He had ideas about uh, America and so, I feel that that's another reason is to look at Louis Sullivan's work. Um, he was in this book, he talks about the influences that shaped him and who uh, he became as a, as a person. So that's another reason why we should read this book is what made Louis Sullivan, Louis Sullivan. And so that's another reason. Now, having seen his influences, we can also say, all right, how does he influence us? What can we take as inspirational points uh, as we lead our own lives and develop our own society? And then finally, just you know, as a personal growth for myself as an educator, I have learned a lot um, from Louis Sullivan. So uh, if we just look at history, so I have pictures of some of his works. Uh, this is a ceiling piece from the auditorium. Uh, in Chicago. Um, if you just look at history, he talks about um, humans as social animals and that we live in this context of society, but society is made up of individuals. And if you understand what is an individual, if you understand the freedom of um, democracy, then you can understand how people can live freely. So that's one of the ideas that he talks about. Um, the other is his timeless work, the you know timelessness um, of his work, right? That even if you go to his buildings today, you are inspired. And um, what makes his work so timeless? That, you know, his architecture is very straightforward. We saw in kindergarten chats, uh, Sherry showed us many different buildings uh, that did all sorts of gymnastics with buildings and they made no sense because they were not balanced. They were not, um, you know, true to their forms. But if you look at Louis Sullivan's architectural work, um, the buildings are true to their forms. Uh, they, they are the, for the function that they serve. And in uh, the introduction, it says that even today, uh, buildings continue to exist uh, to serve the same purpose that they were designed for. It just goes to show his foresight in form follows function, that when you truly design a building for its form, right, uh, for its function, then it'll last a long time. Um, he talks about ornamentation uh, coming from nature and using nature as a source uh, for his designs. So that's another thing. And now how does he come to that conclusion as in this book? So that's another um, thing to look at. Uh, his writings. So Sullivan's uh, style is very interesting. We saw in kindergarten chat uh, chats how poetic it is. In this book, he writes it as a third person writing an autobiography. So that's another interesting way to uh, kind of look at his writings. Um, in his writing, he's always trying to form the laws, the, the laws that are universal, that are governing us, right? And so uh, you can see his quest through his writings. And then um, throughout his work, you can see his belief in what makes um, what makes us Americans and what is that idea of an American? So those are some things. Um, influences that shaped him. He spent a lot of time in nature uh, in his childhood. 
and uh, he he has a he he talks about himself as having a picture memory that if he saw something he would remember well and he um, has fantastic memory of his childhood that he can narrate you know uh, for for some children it's usually for some people it's 10 years and above but he can remember details from a very young age so um, so where does uh, you know his ideas of nature come from and his observations of nature and how they uh, have shaped not just plant life but also human life and what can we learn from that um, so he talks about that and then his idea of uh, self-discipline and uh, self-power. So Joya talked about powers of man and they were, his, his teacher, um, Moses uh, Woolman, was uh, the person that made an impression on him. And, you know, talking about impressions and educators or adults in your life, that is such a big part. So, so self-discipline and self-powers, uh, self recognizing what powers we have, what can human beings do, uh, really came from uh, his early education. And then um, in kindergarten chats, he does talk about uh, a rational mind and um, creative uh, impulse, imagination. Uh, another um, of his big influences was his tutor, Monsieur, uh, Monsieur Clopé. I don't know if I'm saying it, pronouncing it correctly, but that was his French tutor. And uh, he demanded that there has to be a reason for everything, no exceptions. And so when you look at the details of the work that Louis Sullivan does, you can see the mathematical thinking, you can see the, um, the integration of um, his artistic imagination and putting that together, you see the, the scientist, the artist, the architect, the thinker all together represented in the work that he has created. And then um, another big part of uh, Louis Sullivan's work is just the idea of America. And to me, as an immigrant, I think. Uh, it keeps coming up. We came to North Carolina. This is a place I hadn't really seen. And um, just this country is huge and it's beautiful. And there is so much potential. And as I was reading this book, I was like, this is what it is. You know, he traveled, Louis Sullivan traveled to, uh, I think almost 46 uh, states. And um, he, he saw the, the depth and breadth of the country. Uh, he saw the people, he saw the, the uh, beauty in nature, the various landscapes. And he said, you know, how, how do we see this country as a whole? Um, so he talks about it later in the book. And um, he was inspired by uh, Abraham Lincoln and Walt Whitman. And you can see, you know, not just um, the idea of democracy, but spirituality. Uh, he, he was a thinker and listened, uh, much like Abraham Lincoln. And then he also um, took the idea of, uh, you know, the people of this country and how, um, how, how they would be living together and what an ideal situation would look like. So, uh, so that's uh, another reason to look at Louis Sullivan, not just as an architect, um, so then what can we learn from his work? What, what can we see uh, from his work? And, you know, if you look at his uh, work, it's again, um, very pleasing artistically, but also it has integrity. And you can, one of the things Louis Sullivan talks about is when you look at a building, you can see the man behind the building, that the person who designed it, the artist, the architect who designed it. And when you, uh, walk into a Louis Sullivan, Sullivan building, you can first uh, feel that, okay, this is, this is a stable unit. It's, it, there are, there's nothing that's, um, you know, it, it's true to what its uh, design is supposed to be. And uh, you can see that in the work that he does, every detail is thought through. There's a, you can go from the whole to the parts. 
um, you can see the values of just human nature and just being a good human being. And how do you lead your own life using those values? Uh, I think, Joy, are you talking about how it impacted you that you even uh, changed your name and chose a name of your own, um, own liking to reflect who you are? I mean, it just says a lot about how we can learn so much from this book. And then for me, as an educator, I have just um, grown a lot um, as an educator. So I'm a Montessori teacher and uh, I've often, you know, through my uh, training as a Montessori teacher, I've, taught, I've, I've thought about what is the nature of child. Now, something that has happened recently is we have been getting students who have struggled in a traditional system. And I have been uh, reading their uh, test results about, okay, so the, the traditional system, they send them out for testing. They say, this child, we cannot teach this child. Um, and when I see the test results, they have high IQ. Um, and, and what the results show is that the child is distracted. And so after having served many of these children in my classroom, in my school, I started looking for patterns. And what I've seen is really the child is not at fault. It's not that the child cannot learn or the child has a disability. It's the teachers have a disability in teaching. And the reason is because they're caught up in the current political, social, uh, environmental, whatever cause is going on in the current. And, and I'm not talking about just today. I've been teaching for 20 years and I've seen this. A phase comes, a big idea comes, and then they everybody follows that. And that becomes the pedagogy in the classroom. That Those become the lessons in the classroom. So I was actually um, coaching a boy from Asia, uh, a middle schooler, and I said, so what is going on uh, in your head? And he's, he said to me, I am thinking about mining asteroids. I'm thinking about um, you know, uh, building a house. I've already created an idea in my, in my mind and here is a sketch and I'm thinking, how am I going to make it? And he said, when I'm sitting in the classroom, the teachers are just talking about ordinary people. I don't care. I'm thinking about many ideas. So yeah, the teacher has labeled the child and said, this child is, uh, has ADHD and cannot sit still. But that's not the thing. His mind is not challenged. He's not um, taken to the next level. And he's thinking of a thousand ideas where the teacher is just talking about the current political thing, which is important for adults, but not important for the child. And so what is the nature of the child? What is important to study? Why should we study uh, what we study? I think that um, this book has given me a lot of answers. So has Kindergarten Chats. And I think those are the reasons we should read this book. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Um, all right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make brief comments. And then first, if the panelists have questions for each other, we can do that. Uh, Sherry. Um, why, Shrikant, do you think we should read this book? OK, good question. Uh, so, so first is. Um, I also want this, I want to ask people, you know, especially Sherry, this question, you know, what is the place of this book in his corpus, right? You know, he has kindergarten chats, he has got democracy, the man's search, he has the big book, the system of architectural ornaments, he has all these essays, uh, you have his architecture, um, so what is the place of this? So that's one. Um, so I, I really, really like this book. Okay, because I like Sullivan and actually most people don't write an autobiography. So firstly, I'm just tremendously grateful that he has written an autobiography. Second, on the top of that, he actually remembers stuff. Okay, I never remember anything. He remembers everything. Okay. Third is that he actually tells it as an amazing story. And he's actually showing you the making of Louis Sullivan. How did he make Louis Sullivan? So it's autobiography of an idea and it is autobiography of a person. It is autobiography of his art. 
it's all that. And he's actually telling you the story of how he did it. Okay. I mean, what a deal. Um, the image that stands in my mind above all else is the, his image of a child, him as a child. Because again, he keeps, as he keeps telling us, always remember the seed germ because that's where it starts because it has, the child has everything that it needs. It needs to pick up things. It needs to grow. It needs the right environment. It needs to grow. It needs to develop structure, all of that. But the core drive is there. So some of my favorite chapters are the early chapters where he simply describes his experience as a child. So just as a heads up, next week, we are going to do only the first two chapters. Okay, they are fairly short, page nine to page 38 in my edition. So chapter one and chapter two. Um, I would say, skip the preface, skip the foreword. Those are written by other people. Don't look at their writing. Don't look at their commentary. Just go directly into, into those two chapters, okay? Um, so that's my favorite thing. That's why I think this book is actually very good. Now, the good thing is that we have already read Kindergarten Chats, where he has given his full philosophy. Okay. Um, the Democracy of Man's Search talks about kind of applying that philosophy in a social context. The system of architectural ornament shows how to actually design things based on the philosophy. But this is in some ways most fundamental because he's saying, how do you make yourself? Because it's not really about Louis Sullivan. It is about human beings and human potential and how do you build that? That is his story of that. And there is so much to learn in so many different ways, whether it is looking at him as a child and him talking about the moon, which is one of my favorite episodes, or his encountering his first two great teachers and what he learned from them and how important that was. His reaction to life as a child and then his and, and the rest. So that's what, you know, that's what this book uh, does. So that's, that's my answer, Sherry. Is that an okay answer? Yes, I think it's funny that you you said you were going to ask me that question and then you answered it yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay. I, 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 I have to come up with a whole bunch of questions. So, well, the only thing that I would add to yeah. that is that um, I would I would completely agree with what you said. Each of his works gives a particular view into one element of it, um, and you didn't mention his architecture. Um, that obviously, because it's, as he himself tells us, that tells you about the soul of the person who designed it. But you're right, this is telling us how Louis Sullivan created who he was. Yes, no, and the architecture is huge. So it's like when you step into the auditorium, I mean, the grandeur of what is possible. It's like, you know, it's like my reaction was, I didn't know this was possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that kind of a reaction or, uh, you know, Carson Perry's Scott building or the banks. Um, it just shows you and it, it's, and, and you actually feel it because he has mm -hmm. done all the work. So you can simply experience mm -hmm. what it means for something to be appropriate for, for its function. And one of the things, if, if any of you haven't had a chance to tour Sullivan buildings, um, take the time, see if you can find something near you or make a trip. Um, and one of the things that I would say about Sullivan buildings um, is that they have, they have this sort of grandeur of spirit, but they're also extremely intimate. It's like you're there with a close friend. And it's that combination that I think is really fascinating. Um, I grew up in the upper Midwest um, and Sullivan Bank buildings were in all of the little towns. They were in my mind as a child, that's what a bank looks like. <laughs> that's just what a bank is. 
Um, so I, I was treated to that. I had an uncle that lived in Owatonna. Um, and so we would go visit him and we'd go by the bank on a regular basis. Um, it, it, they were just, uh, they just have that amazing spirit to them. Yeah. Um, this observation that you made, it feels like, you know, it's a friend. I feel the same way about his writing. Okay, it is not, I mean, it, and that's actually quite unique. I don't feel that way about most authors mm -hmm. of yeah. actually saying like whether it is kindergarten chats or autobiography and idea, it looks like he's talking to me. Uh, there, is, there is that uh, quality to him. So now it's a chance for panelists to ask each other questions uh, or questions to the panelists. Go ahead and uh, who'd like to go first? Can I ask a question first? Uh, so, okay, so it's going to be Sherry followed by Joya. Sherry, go ahead. Okay, so my question for all the panelists is what was the first Louis Sullivan building you remember visiting, uh, touring, and, and what was your initial impression of it? So I'll answer that. Um, the building I first saw was the auditorium building. And um, on the outside, it looks very plain. And so I didn't know what to expect when I walked in. And when you walk in the, into the stage, I mean, everything about it, you start uh, feeling the ambience and it kind of slowly builds on you and grows on you. And then you go into this auditorium, which is just spectacular. I felt I was in like a jewel, jewelry shop or something where uh, with the lights and, um, you know, uh, the, the decoration, the ornamentation, uh, it just, and, and yet it, you know, although it's so large, uh, you still feel that it's to scale. It's not like you're lost in. It. So that's how I felt over it. Uh, for me, uh, I was planning to move to Chicago and um, I don't know whether this was the first building, but this is one I remember, um, I've already talked about auditorium, so I'll talk about this one. So, and I was planning to uh, rent an apartment and there was a building that Louis Sullivan had designed just across from that. And so I went there, I knocked on the door and they say, oh, it's a private building. So I said, what is it? Uh, you know, it's like, uh, it uh, apparently some kind of architectural thing. So I got talking to the gentleman and fi uh, finally after about 15, 20 minutes, he said, okay, okay, come in. Um, and it was, a, it was the first cooperation between uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan. It was a house in downtown Chicago. So it was designed and, and the facade was completely Sullivan, but as soon as you entered, you can see the, the plan, Frank Lloyd Wright had something to do with it. So you could see both those influences. And it's a very interesting thing because it's a house in downtown whose windows were very high. So from the outside, you had complete privacy, but it looked almost like a, it look, looked almost like a fortress. So you didn't have, you know, it's like it, it had a feeling of a fortress from outside. But moment you entered, it was completely different feel because what Frank Lloyd Wright had done is that there was a skylight, huge skylight, which opened up the entire ceiling and light was streaming in from there, going into every room. So it felt like it was outside. Uh, so they've managed, they've managed to combine both those. So those, that's, that's what I remember, but it's an ingenious solution to being in the city, but having complete privacy and at the same time being open to nature uh, at the same time. Uh, a question, uh, Sherry, uh, 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 Rob, go ahead. You, you just, what you just described, by the way, is one of Sherry's uh, house, early house designs that, that she did, but we'll show you. It doesn't you look at all like. It doesn't look at all like, like Sullivan or Wright, but it has no. the same idea. Anyway, what I would just want to throw in is, and I'm not going to say much about it, but one of my first experiences with Sullivan is I'm pretty sure I saw the, um, the touring production of the musical of Les Miserables at the Auditorium Theater in like 1987 or something like that. Yeah. Wonderful. Sherry, what about you? Yeah. Uh, uh, Joya, Joya, go ahead. So, so I'm, the, I'm the one with the 
paucity of experience here because as a New Yorker, the only Louis Sullivan building I've ever seen is the one Louis Sullivan building that is in New York City. But it's making me realize, I think maybe we should plan like a group trip to Chicago because honestly, the most I've seen of Chicago is the airport. So I would love to go there and experience the auditorium and, and all these really grand Louis Sullivan structures. But even the one in New York definitely has a sense of grandeur. It, it's the skyscraper. And the most recent time I was there was the first time we were actually able to sneak inside and see all of the little details that are there on both the inside and the outside of the building. But it's just making me realize there's there's so much for me still to explore in person with Louis Sullivan's buildings. Joya, what's your question? Oh, so I, I had a question following up on what Sherry had said before about how Louis Sullivan is able to combine both the sense of grandeur and intimacy. And I was wondering if she could say more, even from an architectural perspective of, of how an architect does, does that. Like, wh what is it that he's doing that gives it that intimacy, even though the structures are grand? Um, Rob is, is, is whispering in my ear. What are you whispering? Rookery. Oh, yes. Um, and this is going to be another... Um, another reason for Joy to go to Chicago and <laughs> maybe okay, for so all of actually, us. Actually, no, what I have to say is that we have to arrange at some point the Sherry Trzinski walking tour, of, <laughs> architectural walking tour of Chicago, which she used to do for our friends everyone now and again. Shrikant's been on that too, right? I've been there a couple of times, yes. Yeah, yes. Um, so this is, this is not a Sullivan building I'll talk about, but it relates to the same thing that Sullivan does. Um, and there is a building in Chicago called the Rookery um, near the trade, uh, the, the trade, the board of trade, board of trade. It's on, is it Wabash? I, I'm uh, not going to get the LaSalle, address. Right. The, LaSalle? Yeah, it's on LaSalle Street. Anyway, yeah. it's called the Rookery. The outside is not Frank Lloyd Wright. It's not Louis Sullivan. The inside of the lobby was redone. Um, and it's one of the spaces that I always like to take people on an architectural walking tour because it has exactly that aspect of grandeur at the same time, very, very intimate. And it's something that I've, I've, I've been fascinated with in architecture and how to create that. And it has something to do with the scale of detail. Um, it has something to do with light um, and that's something that both Sullivan and Wright really understood how to bring the light in like you were describing um, where the, the light you, you're thinking that it's going to feel like a fortress from the outside and you walk in and it feels just like a breath of fresh air. That's the way that's what happens with the rookery and it comes it's also peaceful and quiet you're out on this busy noisy street, it feels like the outside of the building is going to be um, you know, heavy and ponderous and you walk in and it is almost this <sighs> that happens because inside it's peaceful and it's quiet and it's sunlit in that kind of delicate light you get in a light forest, you know, where it's dappled and it's gentle. It's not blaring at you. But then the detail, I think that gives you that grandeur of spirit um, that uh, the human being has everything capable to him. Um, and then I think that intimacy comes from a level of detail. Um, so at the Rookery, the thing that I've always pointed out to people was when you're at a long distance, and this I think gets back to something to do with the nature of our eyes, so the physiology of our bodies, our eyes are, if we're looking at something, they're always shifting. They need levels of contrast um, in order to uh, settle on something, in order to see enough contrast for the eye to, to, to uh, define something. Um, and if you get too much contrast, you, your eyes feel like ping pong balls and your brain does too. Um, and too little contrast, um, the opposite thing happens. You just sort of feel floating. What, what Sullivan really does is he has this really nice combination of contrast at the right scale so that it's when you're in a big space and you're looking at the far distance, you're not feeling 
pinballed, if I can make that into a word. <laughs> um, but there's contrast, but it's contrast that's gentle enough at that distance. And then the closer you get to the things that are right in front of you, the things that you touch, like the doorknobs or the elevator buttons or the grills inside the elevators or the detail right around the doorway where you're close to something and you're walking at a slower pace um, and your brain can take in more of that detail, um, then you get a, just the right amount of it at that spot. So I think that that intimacy and that grandeur comes from understanding that level of what contrast and detail you need and what becomes too much. Um, and I think it really, it gets to the idea of honoring the way our brains work in a way. And I don't know that this was ever anything that Sullivan or Wright or any other great architect that's really captured that. I don't think it's ever anything that anybody has written about in a treatise. Um, I've never come across it. Um, but to me, that is the thing, because I've been always wondering, why does this space feel this way? Why does that space feel that way? And those are the things that I'm seeing um, that make those spaces that have that grand spirit, intimate, like you're with a friend feeling. And I think that's part of where it comes from. Wonderful, fantastic. Uh, next up is going to be Rupali. Rupali, go ahead. So I have a question for all panelists and everyone uh, who has read Kindergarten Chats uh, with us. What is the one most influential idea that you take away from Louis Sullivan's work? Okay, uh, and I'm, at this point, I'm opening up for uh, it for everybody. So go, go ahead and type exclamation mark, uh, folks, if you have uh, questions that you would like to raise. So what is the one idea? Uh, there's, so our uh, first panelist, go ahead. Um, I would say to be, to have integrity. Integrity, not only in the work that you do, but integrity within your own soul. Beautiful. How you, Rob? What was? Sorry. We'll come back to Rob. Yeah. <laughs> Joya. So I already shared that I think the idea of the autobiography biography of an idea is the idea of power. And, and I've always seen that at, at these three levels. There's the power of nature, and then the power of the individual, what, what he calls man's powers. And then it, it reaches its full culmination in the flourishing of the power of society, what he calls democracy. Uh, but, but for me, if there was like one big idea, I think it, it is sort of this spirit of what it is to be a creator, what, what Sherry was saying before, the idea that the, the building always reflects the person, that the work of art always reflects who the, 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 the creator was. And that to me is always the big idea that I'm, I'm always trying to be, to, to achieve and that I'm always inspired by from Sullivan. Wonderful. Uh, Jyoti, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't know you were going to reach me so fast. Um, I think what I got from it was that nature is a nourishment to the soul. If you follow the nature, you find the rules of life. And that's a big thing for me. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Beautifully put. Uh, Bob, what did you get from, from uh, Kindergarten Chats? Uh, uh, I am uh, looking at Sullivan for the first time. I, I look at a little bit of his buildings and I'm impressed. Uh, my question is, um, is it possible to uh, have an architect of this quality today? Very good. Very good. So what we'll do is I will answer the question, but let, let people answer. Uh, let me see. Uh, Joe, do you have an answer to the question of what did you, what's the big idea? Yeah, I mean, it's very similar to what Jody had said too. It's the importance of nature. Um, and we, it really hit home when we were uh, having a conversation uh, the other night um, about the idea of a rule and why a rule exists. And a rule is the form. Mm -hmm. And once it stops serving its function, the rule needs to change. And that's a really important thing to understand 
when you start viewing things and how society and how things change and just even how uh, systems work. When the, when the rule stops serving its needs, then it's time for it to change. And that's, that, that's a very profound concept. And that the idea that that's rooted in nature is something that I finally am starting to see how it applies across everything. Wonderful. I mean, for me, it is form follows function. That's really the big thing that, you know, I, I get every time. And it's a kind of idea that I can bring it to bear on anything. And it just gives me new insights every, every time I, I, I do that. So that's the big thing for me. Uh, so let's, uh, so folks, uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to ask questions. First Wait, question. Can, can Rupali answer her question? Sure, if you want. Uh, Rupali, what's your, what's your answer? Um, yeah, so for me, I think um, it's the, the man's powers, the, the powers of man, you know, that what is possible. And it is all possible here and now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, Joe. Does somebody else have a question? Before oh, wait me? a minute. Let, let, yeah. So let's, let's take um, uh, Bob's question. So Bob's question is, can an architect like Louis Sullivan exist today? I, I think yes, except for it's difficult. It's difficult because in commercial architecture, it's driven primarily by developers who, as Sullivan would have said in, um, he, he talks about this in kindergarten chats too, um, that it's only about the, the money and not about the, um, the soul. Um, and so that's driving a lot of commercial architecture. Doesn't have to do all of it, but it does most of it. And in residential architecture, the same thing happens. It's the real estate. Um, the real estate market is constantly pushing you to have everything look just like everything else so that you have good comps. Comparable sales. <laughs> Comparable sales. Um, you also have the same thing happening with, um, so there's a push to the sameness in Commoditization, both. Commoditization, I think is the word. Commoditization, yes. We also have the same thing happening with building codes, which, you know, they were put in place for good intended reasons, but what they do is they push things to the same common looks like everything else, because that's what you can easily get past um, building an inspector. So it becomes harder and harder, still can be done. Um, I want to add that if you wanted to ask that question in Louis Sullivan's time, the answer will also be, it's going to be very hard. It's possible <laughs> and it's very hard. <laughs> very true. Yes. Uh, and, uh, but you can do it as, as he can, he showed, but it is extremely hard. You're going to have challenges because it's about being an innovator, about going against what is taken as quote unquote standard and normal and everything. So you all have to find people. All of that uh, comes with it. It's kind of, it comes with the territory of being an innovator. Um, so uh, yeah. I would say the same thing goes, remember Sullivan talks about um, it's the building reflects the person behind it. So the same thing, um, the idea of being someone with serious integrity who isn't going to say yes to things just because everybody else says yes to them. Um, that's, there's a lot of, of things that come with that bag that, um, that, that make things difficult in life. So it, it's that too, but you're right. It's just the same as it was yeah. then. Wonderful. Uh, next up is Joe. Joe, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I kind of too, uh, I've kind of, uh, now I want to ask a follow up to that last one. Can the constraints be, can constraints drive creativity? I mean, in the sense that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, that we have these rules, but we sometimes think of things that we would have never otherwise thought of and, and, and having to be creative within a set of, you know, within a set of constraints rather than just being able to do what we want. And so, I, I mean, do you ever see, do you think that that aspect of it is true? I would say, 
would say yes, that constraints always are that driver of creativity. Um, but it's it's the other elements of it that are that are pushing you to the sameness. But when you're given um, you know a site restriction or a set of building codes you have to follow, um, there's that's where creativity creativity can start from. Uh, how to figure out a way of doing it in a different way. Um, it's it's the other side of it um, where you're maybe it comes to funding, maybe, I mean, I've, I've, I've actually seen all of these things happen. So when you're getting a, a, lo a loan to build a house um, and they're, they go through a process, um, especially after the housing crisis, the banks go right. through an, an evaluation process and they, based on floor plans, evaluate the price of the house. Well, if it doesn't look exactly like what this box is for that right. price, this box is for that price, that box. If it doesn't fit any of the boxes, then sometimes you have a building inspector who will value the price of the built structure at $100,000 less than what it, it costs to build it. Um, right. And that sort of thing can stop projects in, in the process. Now, the problem there is just an inspector cannot see. He is, he's a box checker, you know? So I've seen that same inspector come back after a house was built and say, oh, now I see, and then raises the price $150,000 on the other side. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's that mindset that can put speed bumps in the way make projects more difficult to do. Now, I can say, as someone who observes this from the outside, what I can say also <laughs> is that the bureaucratic restrictions are not fun restrictions that help spark creativity, they spark annoyance. <laughs> the, the things that she likes is like, here's a really weird, tri weird shaped triangular site. How can you make something that fits that site? So it's more like, you know, here's a weird site that nobody knows how to build. You know, this is a, it's a cheap site because nobody knows how to build on it. How can you come up with a way to do that? Yeah, no, that, that's I, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm saying, I, I would connect this even to what Joe said before, that when we're thinking about rules, that the rules have to come from nature. And when the rules are no longer in, aligned with what right. is there in nature. So there's a difference between constraints that are constraints in nature versus rules that are just old forms that are no longer serving the function that they were originally there for. Beautifully put, Joya. That was, yeah, I mean, that was really well put because I was thinking about this too. This is an artificial constraint, like an economic constraint that's put on. It's not necessarily put on by the architectural aspect of it. It's, it's something that's external to even the building process itself. The building process is the result. And what happens is, that, you know, sometimes the, these... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, that yeah, no, just... That's, that's a great point. I mean, kind of putting it in a general way, um, limits are crucial right. for, for all design. And you always start with limits, but these are real limits that you're talking about, you know, limits of kind of physical limits, the limits of what the thing is going to be used for, you know, this is, and all of those limits, you're, and that actually spurs creativity. So we are, you know, uh, Louis Sullivan is not the pro proponent of saying, do what you feel like. Mm -hmm. It is about saying, do what is appropriate in this context for this function. And all of those are limits. And those limits are limits of the function and limits of what is possible. Um, and those are crucial part of uh, you know, creative design. But these other limits are, as Joya was pointing out, these are like rules which are old forms really. And they were kind of, they came in certain context even when they were right in that context, they're being now applied outside the context and they are actually impeding all functions rather than uh, supporting them. All right, uh, more questions. Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you have a question. Okay, I have lots of questions, but I'm gonna give priority to everybody. Um, Rob has one. Rob. So I was, we're just like, it's like I said, I haven't read this, but we we're just doing a little looking at this beforehand and notice that the, um, this edition says it was originally, it's, it's a 1950s edition, 
but originally based off of the original publication of this by the AIA in 1924. And I said, well, how, how, would, how does that fit it with Solomon's life? Well, it turns out he died in 1924. So, and I noticed the same thing about the edition of Kindergarten Chats as it was published around the same time. And so it looks like it's sort of like everybody, once he, once he actually died, everybody said, wait a minute, you know, we need to figure out what this guy Louis Sullivan had to yeah. say. And almost like it's too late for him because, uh, you know, he had, he had not been, uh, you know, he had struggled in the later decades of his life. But now it's all like there was this revival of his ideas at, after his death. So I wanted, I wanted to see if anybody else had more knowledge about the context and the, 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 uh, uh, the circumstances of that publication. I know somebody who might, Sherry, do you know? <laughs> I can't believe you're doing that, Ralph. Um, it, it really was a revival. <laughs> Like well, weird. it came up right before the thing began, so I didn't have a chance to ask. <laughs> it really was a revival, um, Sullivan's, and you'll. It, it, Shrikant told you all not to read the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but um, wait a minute, uh, Sherry, are you recommending that people read the introduction? Do you think it's yeah, useful? Well, because one of them talks about, and I can't remember which of the introduction or the foreword. Um, I think it. Oh yeah, it's the it's the foreword. Um, when, you know, when, when kindergarten chats first came out, it came out as a serial in a magazine and, um, my reading and architectural history is taking of that is that it was written in a magazine that, um, wasn't really about ideas. It was a builder's magazine. Um, and so we have a really hard time. There was only a couple letters written to the magazine about kindergarten chats at the time. So we don't have a really good sense of how impactful the original publishing of kindergarten chats went. We don't really know, um, at least from that traditional historical data points that we can collect. But this foreword gives you a different idea. And this is an architect, um, Claude Bragan is talking in the foreword and he says, his kindergarten chats impatiently awaited week by week as they appeared in trade journals long since vanished, hidden under drafting boards until the exit of the boss and then eagerly read, destroyed for many young men, I was one of them, the world of ideas into which they had been educated but only to create another and a better world of ideas in their stead. So um, when Sullivan passed, um, there was this big surge of, oh my God, what have we lost? Especially in Chicago, especially in Chicago. And so that's where um, the, 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 the full book publication gathered up all of kindergarten chats he was working on it as a book form late in his life. So that came out then, that's when Autobiography and Idea came out. That's when they started pulling all of those um, journals, all of his essays together in portions. Um, you know, it's like the musician who dies and his record sales go up. It's that <laughs> kind of thing. There is another aspect of this, which is actually quite destructive. Uh, what happened, and this has happened to many, many kind of great creators. What happens is that it is safe after they are dead. Uh, and Very true. Want, yeah, and people want to actually, they actually don't care about them. They don't care about their work. Mm -hmm. And they want to wear that work and take credit for it yeah. after they're gone. So there is some of that, which is actually very, very sad and really, really despicable. And I actually... Um ran into some of that, you wouldn't think that would be the case in say the year 2000 or 1999. You wouldn't really think that people would be anti Sullivan still thinking that no, the ancient Renaissance way is the way to go. Um, back in that year, I was getting my master's thesis in architectural history. And um, one of my favorite professors was a Renaissance architect or architectural historian. 
And he and I tangled quite a lot about Sullivan's ideas. I had mm. wanted to dig into this more, did it in several of his, um, I put it in in a lot of my essays for his class um, to which he and I sparred about them in a very good way, very respectful way. Um, but you could still see it was that, that idea still very much alive um, of whether there was the right approach or the wrong approach, and it still existed. Wow. Okay, next question is from Jyoti. Yeah, my question is, let me see how I'm going to put it together. Um, you know, we see a lot of advertisements about the products. And, you know, we do buy a car, buy a house, buy this, buy that, and uh, they glorify everything. Do you think if the nature was to be commercialized, it will have the same value as the commodities and the products that are advertised? Is that a stupid question? Uh, no. There are no stupid questions. Okay. Um, the uh, I think nature is already com commoditized. It that's is. What, that that's what all the you know all the um, uh, national parks and everything are for. So I, I do, I'm, Yeah, I'm, but. Oh, well, maybe I'm not understanding the question. Okay, I'm saying you no. Know, I think you got a point, and I didn't look at it that way. But I'm thinking. Like uh, you have to, like I wanted to go to the national park. So I had to go into a website to a travel agency and to contact different uh, places that uh, uh, who could help me to make a package plan. But I really don't see that people talking too much about nature. They will be talking about maybe going to different places, Europe, California, Philadelphia, whatever. But it's not like um, there is a talk about nature, what the nature can do for me. You know, I see Lexus car and then they say, how good the Lexus car is, what are the, the features inside? And they will, you know, they will keep advertising it over and over until you have decided, okay, I'll buy it. It's coming too much. <laughs> there must be something to it. And that's what I meant. Anybody wants to answer? Uh, Rupali. So, um, you know, nature is so abundant around us that I feel uh, there's no ownership of that as such. And people don't feel the need to uh, advertise that. But then there are all these health resorts uh, where they're, you know, in a natural setting or so. Uh, but Nature itself hasn't been thankfully commercialized in the way. Uh, yeah. If you go to a garden center or such, you will see certain plants are valued for their qualities, whether it's a medicinal quality or ornamental quality. Um, you know, they, you would see those details, uh, you know, the size of the flower or the fruit, or uh, if you're doing farming and gardening, then the seeds are commercialized. So I, I think there are different aspects of how you consume nature. Yeah, and what nature holds for you. Because when I have people come in in my apartment and I talk to them in the morning, how I see the sunrise and every part of the sky that is facing my apartment has different colors and what the colors do to my mind you know, how they enhance my mood. And I give them, you know, different examples every day today, this, this did this to me or that to me. I want to see that on the, on the commercials so that people understand how nature is important for the growth, for the mind, the growth of the mind, for the soul. That's what actually I was talking about. But I know what you are saying, uh, Rupali. I have seen those advertisements of even the agriculture garden that we have. I, you know, they talk about the medicinal values of these plants. So I understand that, but I guess I'm, I was talking about from a different aspect because people are like in awe when I tell them 
it was like an artist who was drawing on the sky with different colors, crayons, and each crayon has a, if it is a blue, I feel this way, if it is red, I feel that way. I think if they, that kind of sense we can put in people, they will gravitate more towards non-material things than material things. That's what I mean. Thank you. Next up is oh, uh, can, can uh, Sherry, just... Sherry, Joya. Let and... Joya go first. Okay, Joya. Um, I, I just had some thoughts when, when Jyoti even just started describing her, her own impressions with the, the sunrise and the, the, the sunset patterns. I was just thinking on some of the travel writing that I read about national parks and about going to gardens. And it strikes me that, in my opinion, the, the travel writing that moves me the most is the ones where you really get a sense of that particular individual's response to the nature. And one of the most amazing things about that is that every individual is an individual, which is maybe the thing that makes it hard to commoditize because every time an individual has an experience with nature, there's always gonna be something about it that is unique. So even Jyoti's description of what she experienced with that sunset, it would be different if I were there and if Sherry were there and, and Rupali and Rob and Shukant that, and that, that's part of the, the, the grandeur of, of living. And I just wanna say, I hope that maybe Jyoti would consider writing or speaking about some of her experiences with nature. And, and one of the great things about the internet is that it, it makes it possible to put up a, a blog or a video blog or an audio blog and, and we can start sharing all of these stories about our, our experiences with nature. I would love to read that. Thank you, Joy. You gave me an idea. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, I would too. And actually, um, that was absolutely perfect. I wanted to add on to something Jody said, but Joya did such a perfect transition between the two that I, I have to say thanks for that. So what I wanted to talk about was um, uh, this is a little pet project I've had uh, for many, many years, talking to all of my friends from who grew up in different places um, and how different our senses of what that nature that you go to for that deep rejuvenating sense. You know, you're all, you all know what I'm talking about. You, when you have that need, you need to go some place to really rejuvenate. What is that place for you? So I've gathered these thoughts from friends over the years and I'm fascinated at how different they are. I have a friend who grew up um, on an island um, in the Caribbean. And for her, it has to be the sound of the sea and the smell of the salt air. If you take her to the mountains, and there's no water, it doesn't work for her. <laughs> for me, it's the northern woods of Minnesota where it's always slightly damp and cool and you smell mosses and pine. Um, and it's, it's never that far away from being cold. Even yeah. in the summer, <laughs> even in the summer. So it, it's 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 the high of ninety three today in Virginia. That's why she's thinking about. No, and for Rob, it's something totally different. And I think Shrikant and I we've talked about this before. But that's something that I think would be really interesting for everybody to think about. Is is that uh, my sense of it is that the the bit of deep rejuvenating experience in nature for each of us has to do with a major event in their lives or from their childhood. If they spent time as a child like Sullivan did in the forest or on the beach or on the lake or in the mountains, almost 99% of the time, those people will refer to that childhood rejuvenation sense for what is the most soul satisfying nature experience they can have. Or maybe it's something that it was a major turning point in their lives. Um, so I'm curious to know for all of you, what is the rejuvenating touch of nature for you? And is it related to a turning point in your life, your childhood or something completely different? Um, so I'll, I'll go first. Um, you know, I grew up in Bombay and the 
access to nature that I had was the ocean, which is only like five to seven minutes walk away. And I would routinely go there. Uh, and it's a spectacular thing, especially, I mean, my favorite times were in the middle of monsoon where nobody in their right mind would be on the beach and I would be the only person on the beach. Uh, there would be pouring rain in all directions with the uh, large waves, you know, because the, the sea gets all riled up with that. Uh, just so that that's what so I, I really like the water. So my shortcut here, I also like something which is near because it can be in, integrated into your life a lot more easily. So for me, it's a Hudson River, which is about five minutes walk, six minutes walk from my place and the whole river. Uh, so that's 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 mine. Um, anybody else wants to share? Go ahead and type exclamation mark. So my, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, go ahead, Rupali, followed by Joya, followed by Joe. I, I thought I put my name. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Rupali first, you go ahead. Okay, thanks. So um, when I grew up, uh, we had a small hill uh, in our uh, neighborhood. And uh, so Rohit and I, we were neighbors growing up. And we would go to, the, to this little hill every weekend. And uh, literally, it was five minutes uh, away and then you start, you're at the foothills. So we li literally lived at the foothills. And we'd walk up to this hill and then look at the whole city uh, from the top and, you know, just um, feel the cool air and the, the rocks were very beautiful and different and just looking at those rocks and trying to make sense of why they're there and just talking to each other. And so that, that going up to the mountains or hills is very, um, pleasing and satisfying for me. Um, this morning we went to a little Japanese garden uh, over here and I we were just standing on a bridge and I asked my son, you know, what do you think is this bridge for? And he said, well, it just connects so many parts. It's not just connecting the physical parts of the land, but uh, it gives you this feeling of serene belonging that, you know, you're connected to this landscape. So. Those are two cents from my end. Wonderful. So it's going to be Joya, Joe, and Jyoti. Uh, Joya. So I grew up in the suburbs, and I did not like the suburbs. And now as an adult, I live in the perfect place because I always tell people we live an hour's drive to New York City and a mile walk to the beach. So one of mine is definitely the beach. I love to be my my bare feet in the sand, in the water. That's what I like to do. Just walk up along, up and down the coastline and just that experience of my toes in the sand and the waves crashing over me. But I want to add too, and maybe this connects with Louis Sullivan, that for me also, it's not just nature, but I guess you could say environment more broadly because skyscrapers to me are also a really important environment. So living in this place, it, it's going to the beach and it's also going to New York City. To me, New York City is just the most invigorating place. I, I have told people that my idea of heaven is just walking through New York City with a cup of coffee when I'm just sort of calm and composed and just having just the energy of the city all around me. So those are my two big places. And so I, I just want to make this point that I think architecture properly and skyscrapers in particular uh, are, are a way that that environment even builds upon nature and also can give us that experience. Wonderful. I, I, I second that uh, many, 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 many times over. So next up is uh, Joe followed by Jyoti. Joe. Yeah, I mean, I actually, it's, I need to thank Joya, Joya for that. Uh, answer because I mean the reason I, it's the beach for me and in the sense that the ocean itself uh, but the real reason I enjoy it so much is because I, I like it to see it I mean, as you had mentioned uh, Srikant when it's like calm and angry and see the distinction but it reminds me of my own insignificance and that's the that's the beauty of it is that you know you're walking along the sand and you see this vast ocean and it's just it really does just take you away. Um, I also get a similar feeling in the mountains, though. 
I, I will say that uh, out in Colorado, I, I have similar, but not the same. I'm still an ocean person. I, I definitely need the ocean. But interestingly enough, um, every time, every now and then, I, when I'm walking through, and specific, uh, especially in New York, I do notice the skyscrapers. They make me feel a little insignificant as well because you look up at them and you think about how you know all the effort and all the planning and everything that went into them, there is a certain amount of insignificance that you feel with that. It's not the same as nature. Nature just seems like, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's something that is beyond comprehension almost. Um, but whereas the, the, but these structures, these in, in, in New York, they can make you feel the same, have you know, make you feel the same way where you just are in awe and you realize your own insignificance in that process. Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti, you need to unmute. I like the way you asked Sherry your question. I really liked it because that's how I asked myself the same question because I have been searching for the, for the voice and the, the melody of the windmills for years, for years. When we, we lived, our house was the second house in the fields and there was nothing there. There were mustard plants around my house. I used to chase the butterflies. There were red rocks, there were red sand. And then you went all the way towards the end of the territory. Then there were fields where, where there were a lot of vegetables growing free, loosely grown vegetables, squash, okras, tomatoes and stuff like that. And then there were windmills. And I never got over the sound of them going round and round because they echoed in the air. And I could hear them even when I would come, I, was ride, I, I would ride my bike home and I would say, I can still hear it. So it's, it has always remained in me. And I'm always searching, always searching. If the, in the beginning, when, if I didn't find that nice little windmill noise wherever I went, I was not going to enjoy it. It's only later on I transformed myself and I said, but what you have in front of you is not bad. <laughs> enjoy it. And I also like the mountains and the hills, but because there were a lot of hills and now there's a Gurdwara there where they, you know, took them. Now if I go back to that place, it's not the same. But I was so fortunate that all my feelings about nature emerged from those times that I was part of that. And it was so close to me. I would get up in the afternoons. My family would be taking naps because in India it gets very hot. And they, they used to always tell me to take naps. Don't go out in the afternoon. But I was chasing the butterflies. There were mustard plants all over around my house. And I would take the butterfly, fly it away, take the other one. And that was my game all afternoon because I had no friends. We had grown people and my you know, older siblings were either playing cards or taking whatever, you know, resting up. So I got all that in me and it will never leave me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, next up is Evanique. Yeah, for me, I think the mountains are the first one, like my number one go-to. And I remember I didn't really have an experience of the mountains until I was in college and I went on an alternate spring break, which was doing community service in West Virginia. And one of the things that is just beautiful, especially in Appalachia region, is the mountains. And especially at night when like all the stars would light up the sky. It would be like the best feeling ever. It would be so peaceful, so calm, so beautiful, and just being in the mountains. I love the beach too, and but I like the beach in the fall. I don't like it in the summer. And the fall is the best time. It's cool. The sand is cooler. And I think there's less people. And it, to me, it's less commercialized. So you get to go and really enjoy the water and the beach and not have so many distractions surrounding you. So like, I love going to Virginia Beach in like October, September, October, even if I have to have a jacket because it just is peaceful and it's calm. And like even staying in the hotel in the water, you can open up your balcony at night and hear the water at night as you're sleeping. Yeah. And it's just the perfect calming 
soothing thing. So like those are my two like go-tos when I need to be in vigor, like when I just need to like compose myself or to get reinvigorated and just to really comprehend like the beauty of what we have here on earth. So that's my wonderful. Ebony, Ebony I, you and I could take those rejuvenating vacations together because I totally <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> right summer, it's too hot in the summer <laughs> the, the sand burns your feet you're like oh my god i can't stand it and then in the fall is like oh it's beautiful so yeah we could <laughs> uh wonderful uh so folks uh any more questions um i have i have a question i think this this theme of talking about nature i think that is there throughout louis sullivan as nature as serving as this almost infinite source of inspiration, which is always there and something that you go, and it's not constant, it is continuously changing. Even the rhythms of nature, like the, the different seasons, uh, different places, they all kind of serve as a reminder of saying, this is the richness of what is possible. And then everything that you do and every, you know, everything that you think of, you're using that as a background, as a standard saying, okay, can I match that? So I think that that's a huge thing in, uh, in Sullivan. Um, all right, so any, uh, any more questions, any more thoughts or any more comments? Okay, uh, let's see, anything? Uh, so let me just go one by one. Uh, Rupal, you want to add anything, any closing thoughts? I'm just going to read. I know Shrikant said, don't read this forward and oh, introduction. Okay. But All right, I, I have been outvoted. Go ahead and read it. I'm going to read this part. Um, I, I, just want to, I just want to explain to people a little bit, just one cent, couple of sentences. See, I always, for all works, I generally like to go to the original source and I, I will read what other people have to say, but typically I'll read it afterwards because I don't want their view of what is being said to dilute my experience, my encounter with the thinker. That's the reason I, I recommend the way I do, but please go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, there's something about uh, Sullivan, you know, that he, um, he, he challenged the, the common thought and the belief and, that existed that you know everything had to be done in the uh, renaissance style or the classic style and then uh, he he just would not take that for an answer and created his own so um let me let me just find it that um, oh here i think sherry you read this earlier this phrase evolved by sullivan's through long contemplation of living things guided him in all his work. We're just talking about nature and observing nature. And um, he spent a lot of time as we've all talked about, even towards the end of the book, he talks about spring and summer, fall and autumn uh, and winter uh, in his work. So the, the long contemplation of living things guided him in all his work. He was firm in his conviction that no architectural victim or tradition or superstition or habit should stand in the way of making an architecture that fitted its function, a realistic architecture based on well-defined utilitarian views. Um, from from uh, this seed in an era of classical Renaissance architecture, the modern movement grew slowly in small areas for four decades. It was not until the 1930s that the movement gathered mo momentum. So the, th the point that I um, want to make is that, you know, all of Louis Sullivan's work, it takes time and it took time for it to become part of um, the culture. We still experience it. And I personally feel the same way about education that we don't have to take the standard way of doing things that we're doing for education that you know, look at the nature, look at the child. And um, there is a lot that has to change. 
we still haven't reached the place where Louis Sullivan saw civilization to be. So there's a lot of work for us, us to do. Wonderful, thank you. Next up is Choya. Choya, any closing thoughts? I just wanted to read something from chapter one to hopefully be a teaser to get people to want to read the book. There's so much in this book I love and here's one of them. Uh, so this is Louis Sullivan, he spent most of his time with his father. The bond of union was the love of the great out of doors. Too young to philosophize and search his soul to discover sin, he took all things for granted. It seemed natural to him that there should be flowers, grass, trees, cows, oxen, sunshine and rains, the great open sky, the solid earth underfoot, men, women, children, the great ocean and its rock bound shore. All these he took at their face value, they all belonged to him. And in the story, we're going to see how he took all of this and took it all in and what he was able to do with all of that. Yeah, I love that phrase. They all belong to him. That, that is core of his approach to things. Uh, Rob and Sherry. You go ahead. No, you go ahead. I actually don't really have. I, I haven't read this yet. Rob hasn't read it. Are you excited? I am excited to read it. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. I have not touched it at all. <laughs> um, I am just very much looking forward to diving another deep dive into uh, a part, part of Sullivan um, with all of you. It's been um, going through the, I guess it's two previous books, not one Sullivan and, and then um, um, Ayn Rand's book on, on Romantic Manifesto. Um, they have been such... Uh, rewarding experiences for us, um, for both of us. Um, it's been a great fun to be able to, to connect with all of you from wherever you are, um, even as the pandemic sort of winds down and we can actually talk about maybe all getting off to one city or another or one nature location or another to kind of join in together. But this has been um, uh, a great deal of fun, and I really look forward to diving in again. Wonderful. All right, folks. So we'll see you uh, one week from today at 2.30 for the chapter. So remember, next time it's chapter one and chapter two. And if you want, you can read the foreword and the preface. All right. <laughs> <Very loud. laughs> All right. See you, folks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.